the the key one when it comes to young authors, I think, is reading widely in your genre. And in one sense, that's nothing to do with writing, but in another sense, it's everything to do with writing because it it gives you a sense of the nuances of language, um, and it gives you a sense of what 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 works in the genres that you're interested in. So read widely, but also read as much as possible in the types of genres and stories that you might be interested in writing yourself because you want to learn that sense of pacing um, and that sense of what works as far as character tropes and um, themes are concerned as far as as far as th- those particular genres are concerned so that would be my greatest encouragement because I know a lot of people don't read widely these days and it is extremely important to read widely if you are going to write. So that would be my greatest tip. Hey everyone, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. I have a yet another awesome author from across the pond from where I am here in Canada. Excited to bring on great authors. Uh, and uh, it's, we get to learn from each other and get to learn from other people in the space. I know I have a lot of authors listening to the show. You're learning how to write. And anytime we can hear from an author who has written many books. It's nice to learn from them. So Catherine's here to teach us everything she knows on the podcast. And you could fall in love with a great author at the same time. Catherine, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Welcome. Thank you for having me here. It's great to have you here. Tell everybody, Catherine, where you are in this great big world of ours. So I'm in a special little place called Sheffield in the United Kingdom. We are right in the middle of the British Isles, effectively. Um, And we are built on seven hills, much like Rome is built on seven hills. And we are famous for the film The Full Monty, which you may not have heard of. Hang on. (laughs) It's it's a film about, new, you know, like a a group of male strippers back in the 90s. So and it's a lot of fun. Okay, so <laughs> that's a very interesting claim to fame for your community to be tied to that movie in particular. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> interesting. Absolutely. Okay, well, there you go. Is that like on the sign when you come into town, home of the full Monte? No. no okay, all right. Just Because no. that could have different it connotations <laughs> depending on how you want to take that. So. <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Well, that's great. Um, are you born and raised in Sheffield? or? No, I'm from a more rural area okay. um, in in an area called Norfolk on the East Coast. Um, and yes, yeah, so I moved to Sheffield about 15 years ago and I've been here ever since. Good. And it's basically my adopted town. I, I love it so much. I love I, lo- I love the hills. I love the sense of community. Um, and yeah, just love being here. It's a very multi- multicultural, exciting city. Excellent. How did your author journey start, Catherine? Where did it all begin for you? Did you start as a reader? And then you're like, I want to become an author. How did it begin for you? So I've always been a reader. Um, I think most authors are. Um, I've loved reading since I was very, very young. And I used to voraciously read the Narnia books, all the Enid Blyton books, um, the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, um, and many, many, many more um, when I was growing up as a child. Um, And I just was... I I saw the power of story, storytelling from a very, very young age. And I realized how how it had the power to to take you into other worlds, to help you to empathize with people. Um, I still remember today reading the Laura Ingalls Wilder books. And I was reading the book, um, The Silver Chair, not The Silver Chair, um, on the shores of on the shores of Silver Lake. Um, and Laura's Laura and her family had this faithful dog called Jack who just followed them all the way across the prairies from Wisconsin. And at the beginning of On the Silver Lake, um, the dog dies and it's absolutely heart-wrenching and I remember crying. Um, 
but I'm not actually a dog person myself. I'm not really into into dogs or pets particularly. But you felt so much for the kind of faithfulness, the loyalty of this dog. You felt as a as a reader, you felt attached to this to this character, this to this pet, um, because of the love of the the family for this dog. So that's just one example of how how I understood how powerful empathy is um, and how powerful reading is for drawing out empathy in in readers. And I, I, even today, I think it's an incredible force, force for building empathy in, in people. Um, and as for my own writing journey, I think when I was younger, I wanted to be a writer. You know, when I was five or six, I used to want to be a writer. Um, but then that sort of changed in between. And I decided I wanted to be an actress. And then I wanted to work in publishing. And then I became a teacher. But all the while, the kind of dream of writing something eventually was there. But it was only around 2006. Um, and I was living out in Cambodia. Um, having kind of a six month stint out in Cambodia doing um, kind of teaching, volunteer teaching work. Um, and when I was in Cambodia at the time, I was staying in a, a rural area called Ratanakiri. Um, and I was staying with a, a missionary family who were living there. And, um, and there was a maid who was sweeping the upstairs area and I was totally at this stage I totally wasn't used to the idea of having maids or servants and I found it really really disconcerting as a as a westerner it made me really uncomfortable anyway I was lying on a hammock and while I was lying on this hammock the maid was dusting underneath me and it was at this point that I got this just kind of brain drop almost of 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 this incredible idea for the very first story that I ever wrote um and it was and it was the whole idea in essence that sort of dropped into my head at that point in time and i got really stirred by this idea and um and it's it's good that it was there at the time and it and it sort of stuck with me because it was it had to last with me for about 8 years which is how long it took me to write my first novel so my first novel lydia's song um is a story of hope um in a kind of child trafficking context and it's set in Cambodia and the character the protagonist of the story is a is a character called Lydia who is an English teacher te teaching out in Cambodia at the time um so in some ways she's quite similar to me um but in other ways she's not me at all um and she fosters or informally fosters a Vietnamese girl who is who is um who ends up on her doorstep and then and then eventually this child ends up getting sold into sex trafficking. Um, and it's really about these two women eventually finding one another and discovering one another again and their sort of relationship and kind of how hope comes out of a very dark, dark, dark situation. So this particular story, like I said, because it was a strong idea, it really stuck with me for quite a long time. But it was... 2013 before that story was published so it really was a long it really was a long period of time waiting for that kind of novel to come to fruition um and during that time I was kind of doing lots of things like teaching living in Cambodia getting married cross-culturally having babies and so it just and because it wasn't no I, I didn't have anybody on my back telling me that I needed to to get this done by a particular date. I think that's another reason why it took time okay. for me to write. All right. That's it. Yeah, so that's how I really got into it because once I'd written my first novel, that was it really. I, I knew that this was a kind of calling and that I wanted to do to do more of it. Wow, okay. And how many books total do you have right now? So I have three mm. full-length novels. Okay. Um, one of them is called Lydia's Song. That's the first one. The second one is called Home Truths with Lady Grey. Effectively, that's a sort of story about the power of friendship to unlock new ways of seeing life and self. And it and it covers kind of topics such as um, uh, living with a 
disability, um, gambling addiction, loyalty, friendship, family, and and actually finding yourself as well. So that is set in Sheffield, where I live. And then the final novel is called Tea for Tolerance. Um, and that is actually a YA dystopian novel. Um, and it's set 20 years from now in the future. And, and, and in essence, what it is, is it's... Um, it's about freedom of speech being no longer a legal right and where the concept of tolerance has been twisted. And there's a young teenager called Satya who shares her beliefs and then is betrayed by her twin sister and ends up having her own rights stripped away. And being surrounded by danger on all sides, she ends up battling her doubts as well as the thought police who are trying to break her. So it's all about sort of trying to hold on to truth in the midst of a very, very dark, challenging time. Um, and this is the first in a series because I have a I have a series idea planned for tea to to for tea for tolerance. Mm. But as of yet, I have only just started dipping into the second one. So I've not got not got very far with it yet. When you say thought police, my mind starts to picture what that entails um it feels like it's not really 20 years from now that this is said and it's almost mm -hmm. like it's now because we're dealing with a lot of this mm -hmm. happening in our world today right but can you tell unpack for us yeah, a little yeah. bit more about the thought police and how they play a role in this because i'm curious about that sure. yeah i mean when it comes to just a second when it comes to, uh, just bear with me because I'm just looking for some notes that will help me with that one. Mm. So Thought Police, it comes down to this idea of freedom of speech, okay? So freedom of speech is something that we value as a society. Well, not in all societies, but generally speaking, it's something that westernized societies really value because I think ultimately, if we don't have freedom of speech, then it means that we're living under fear because you need to be able to have the freedom to express yourself because otherwise you're going to end up in this place where you're you're trapped all the time and fearing what might happen if you say the wrong thing. And the wrong thing is always going to be dependent on how what the status quo is um, and on what particular kind of echo chamber you're living in as well. So what what is considered kind of offensive to one person is actually something beautiful and wise to another person. So freedom of speech just allows us to be able to communicate what we think in a way that is without being afraid of what is going to happen to us if we do express ourselves. And I think the thought police is an idea that came out of George Orwell's book, 1984. Um, and in essence, it's not necessarily a particular group of people, but it's the kind of ideology surrounding the idea that if you don't follow the status quo in your thinking and in your speech, you're going to end up being shut down or cancelled. Um, and we we are, like you say, we are seeing elements of that now. Um, but where it differs in, in my imagined world 20 years from now is that by speaking out in a way that goes against the status quo, um, you're having your rights taken away from you and you could end up being persecuted as well as potentially worse things happening to you. I don't want to give yeah, away no, too no, much yeah. because I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but it's very dangerous. Let's put it that mm. way. Um, it's not like being just being cancelled in this kind of in the here and now. Yeah. So being cancelled in the here and now is a horrible thing. Um, but often it's something that blows away over time and that people quickly forget about so some examples being jk rowling yeah. and and the way that she was cancelled yeah. for speaking out uh, 
or she she expressed some very considered views about gender and trans people on social media and essentially got accused of being transphobic. So there was cancelling that came from her um some of her cast members as well, which I thought was incredibly sad. Um, but I think now, perhaps because of a change of thinking about some of these trans issues, um, actually some of that cancellation has already been rolled back. So it's not having the same impact on JK Rowling as it would have done when it first happened yeah. at all. Okay. And obviously because she's a rich and powerful woman, it might not have the same influence on her as being cancelled as it as it would on other people right. who who don't have as much influence. Mm. So in essence, that's what the thought police are. They are people who are looking out for you making a misstep in terms of your your viewpoints, um, and then pretend, and following through with consequences. A little bit more extreme consequences than what we're seeing today. Then, exactly right. in yeah. your book, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you see? Do, you, do is this something that you're you're personally kind of thinking through and dealing with? And that was kind of the spark to write the book. Like, is that is that something from a writer's point of view that you're a little bit concerned about being monitored in that way by a thought police? I mean, I think it's not necessarily something I'm personally fearful about. Um, but I think it's something that, as a society, we should all be thinking about or concerned about in one way or in another. And I don't think it's because often people think that freedom of speech is like a, you know, it's a right wing fear or it's a right wing concern. Um, but actually, I consider myself, generally speaking, I'm a, I tend to, my politics tends to fall a little bit more on the left wing side. But I think as far as speaking out against issues that um that are issues of injustice um or unrighteousness if I want to use kind of traditional language then I want to be able to have the freedom to express my viewpoint whether it's particularly palatable or not I think there are ways and means of expressing viewpoints in, in such a way that you're not kind of coming down hard on other people and you're not expressing yourself in a hateful way. Um, but at the same time, there should be that freedom to be able to express viewpoints that might not be falling in line with the prevailing culture. Um, and I think there is, there is a lot of fear around um, and there is a lot of kind of cancelling around um, that means that the truth cannot can be very undermined and I think we are losing we are losing kind of that sense of what truth really is um, and there's lots of people speaking out against crushing of truth but a lot of the time that is so it's very twisted um, yeah, there's, it's often a distortion of the truth in and of itself. And then it becomes difficult for the audience or the readership to really know, well, what's really going on here? Because they're hearing one particular point of view from maybe one political party, for example, but they're not getting the whole big picture. Or they're just they're just hearing the the details or the nuggets that have been whitewashed rather than sharing the whole story. Um and I think with the rise of social media, we're, we're getting more and more of this kind of thing happening as well, where it becomes more difficult for some people to be able to differentiate but, um, different points of view and to be able to just look at an issue in a nuanced way because they get into these echo chambers of this is this is my viewpoint and this is the only viewpoint I want to listen to. And therefore, anything else out there must be a lie. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, and it's very disturbing. Yeah. And when I think to like hundred. So I think that was, that was part of my thinking when it came to writing the story. I was also thinking about writing a refugee. I really wanted to write a refugee story. Um, so, and, and, but I was at the same time I was trying to, I was trying to think about, well, how do I write something 
which is, you know, that whole idea of write what you know. So I come from a culture where, you know, you most people are, it's kind of considered a free Western democratic society and we don't get people who are running away as refugees from this country. Um, so then I got on this kind of thinking, speculative thinking, well, what if? What if um, cancel culture became such an extreme and the idea of tolerance was so twisted that actually more and more people are going to be in this position where if they do speak out, they end up getting persecuted and having to potentially flee for their lives. Right. So that's where my story came from. Okay. Good when we look at society today and how we can look at things like hundreds of years ago, there was power in community. You needed each other yeah. just to survive, right? So community was yeah. the most important thing. But today it feels like the power is more about the individual. It's no longer our mm -hmm. truth as a community. It's my truth as a person, right? So there's a break mm -hmm. that's happening where it seems like we value our independence in our own way of thinking. Mm -hmm. and what's right for me is what's right for me. And it, it might offend you, but it's my right to be me. Or again, going back hundreds of years yeah. ago, nobody was standing up saying, well, it's my truth to be this, right? It's, well, it was more about what's the, what benefits a community. And I think we've kind of seen a shift, exactly. a shift in that in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the cross-cultural dynamics that I'm kind of a part of are, are really interesting because my husband, he's from India. Hmm. Um, and so he's from a culture which is much more about the community, as you say. Right. And there's this kind of honor shame thing that goes on rather than that sense of truth and justice and um, individuality. It's much more about the community and looking out for the whole community, the body of people, um, rather than just looking out for number one. And I think that's an important, there's there's downsides to every culture, ultimately. But um, I think having having that balance of recognising that we are individuals and that we are all unique, but at the same time, um, recognising that we're part of a body, we're part of a bigger group of people and we have responsibilities as well as rights. Right. And the influence of different communities blending together, in the UK, here in Canada, we have people coming from all different parts of the mm -hmm. world calling our communities home now, but they're bringing their yeah. their sense of community into the conversation now as a new resident in their new community. And they're going to want a little bit mm -hmm. of home, but as well experience a little bit about their new place where they have moved to. So they're trying to blend all this together at the same time. So you're having this pull, push and pull happening in our communities today that we're kind of navigating as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, and I think I've seen some of that in my own family life as well, in the sense that, well, we're both, we're both Christians, um, my husband and I, and when it's come to building a family and raising our kids, we've tried to, you know, take aspects of both cultures, but also we're thinking, well, what kind of, family culture what kind of kingdom culture do we want to build within our within our household um so we're wanting to raise our kids to you know to be responsible citizens to look out for other people um to be caring to be loving um we want them to have that sense of responsibility um and a heart for for looking out for other people rather than just for the just looking out for themselves ultimately um so i think that's had an influence in terms of how we've raised our kids and how we're how we're bringing them up now obviously we're not perfect yeah. but <laughs> nobody is what are some of your influences as, a, as an author and as a person i think those two things are tied together but some of your outside influences mm. that kind of direct you and guide you as a person yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think my, I have what's called a USP. So in the author world, um, you're often encouraged to come up with a unique selling point that expresses who you are as a writer. Um, um, 
what I say about myself is that I love to write stories that touch on social issues and explore the space where cultures cross. So I think very much for me, the idea of um, social in, social uh, justice has has been at my the heart of kind of some of my concerns for quite a few years, especially since I've been an adult. Um, so even down to the fact that obviously my first novel, Lydia's Song, was exploring child sex trafficking. Um, and I've touched on issues such as slavery and um, female gen- genital mutilation, um, on cancel culture. I'm very, I am very passionate in terms of writing about themes but you what you mustn't do is allow those themes to dictate your story you've got to put the story first so what you don't what you don't want to do is end up with something that's really didactic and just preachy you need to allow the story to lead um so i think that's been at the heart of my writerly journey um also yeah that whole thing of cultures crossing i think it was something that I only because obviously I've married cross culturally um, by marrying an Indian, and so we're raising we're raising mixed race kids, um, and we both of us have lived and worked in overseas. Um, I've lived and worked in um, Australia, Cambodia. We've had hundreds of refugees and asylum seekers that we've got to know um over our over the years through kind of our work or our church contexts um and i think those those that kind of cross cultural aspect has been very much a part of me in fact even since i was a child it was one of those things that i didn't really recognize when i was growing up but my mum is greek cypriot um by ethnicity and so we were ra- i was raised in an um orthodox christian environment and i think for me i i I felt slightly other when i was growing up because of this kind of cross-cultural dynamic but i didn't really recognize it as being that at the time because my mum was very like i'm british Mm. um (laughs) and very sort of adamant that that's that's what she is which is fine because she is but at the same time that britishness is very much mixed up with her being greek as well um so i think those kind of cross-cultural influences have been there from a from a very young age um but i think have become even more important as i've as i've grown up and moved out into the world as an adult and um developed lots of cross-cultural friends and cross-religious friend friends as well i have lots of friends who are muslim and um and hindu so yeah um, so I think those things have a huge influence on my writing. Um, what else? And, and my faith has had a huge influence on my writing as well. Um, so I I don't exclusively write necessarily typically Christian fiction, although Lydia's Song and Tea for Tolerance both fall under that Christian category. Um Home Truths with Lady Grey is more of a general women's fiction, contemporary women's fiction, um, and was published by a secular publisher as well. But my faith kind of imbues and has an impact on everything that I write about um, in terms of my worldview and in terms of what I consider important um, and in terms of what I will will write about um and i think some of the things that i might write about might be different to what other christian authors might choose to write about um and that's partly because i i believe in exploring areas which are challenging areas potentially because because i think that we are all fallen vulnerable beings um and often kind of the most fascinating stories come out of the darkest places but within those dark places and those dark themes there is always a there is always an element of hope in my stories um and that hope is very much kind of influenced by the fact that i'm a christian okay All right so for a uh, a new reader coming to to you as an author and finding your books for the first time 
Do you have any mm-hmm. message to them directly? Kind of like your author love letter to a reader about your books and who you are as an author? Your hope for them? Um, can I just say I don't know how to answer mm-hmm. that question? Dave. Yes. Um, Just like as a reader coming, I'm not really sure how yeah, to, as a reader coming yeah. to you, and they don't know you've met you mm-hmm. met you before. They're meeting you for the first time, mm-hmm. and they they just want to know what type of author you are and your connection with them. Really, is there any type of message mm-hmm. you'd have for them? It's like this is who I am, and this is who I'm writing for, and I'm just thinking, yeah, you know, what you would say to them as a new community member and reader of of your books. Absolutely. Okay, so I think part of that is expressed by my USP. So that whole thing, I love to write stories that touch on social issues and explore the space where cultures cross. And really that covers the the different genres that I write in, because as well as writing those two women's fiction books that I mentioned, the Lydia's Song and... um. Home Truths with Lady Grey. I've also got that YA young adult novel as well, which is for which is for people who are maybe looking for they they might be young adults, but they also might just be people who love reading dystopian fiction. So I to be to be fair, when it when I look at my um reviewers, the people who've reviewed on Amazon, a good number of those people and those reviewers have been adult, to be fair. Um so I think that one type of review, one type of reader would be that YA novelist or adult who is looking for something that's gritty, but with a sense of hope. Um, and then the others are likely to be women, um, probably women who who love emotional books that take you on an emotional roller coaster ride. Um and are drawn to themes such as redemption and and hope and um, forgiveness and uh, friendship and betrayal. So I think it really does depend on the book. So in one sense, there's not necessarily one typical reader, but there are there might be different readers who would be drawn to different types of my book. Okay, that's good. It kind of helps us to identify your audience and your community. And again, as a listener, okay. I'm listening to connect with you or as well, I'm listening for my friends and family who would love your books. So I can make that connection and go, this is the this is the, ar- the target for my audience. And this is, as a reader, this is the author I'm looking for. I really want to make that connection so that they can connect with you. Sure. Right. That's great. So how do you have a sense of how many books you might see in the new series combined or is it kind of open at this point? It's open at the moment. I'm I loosely have 3 in my mind okay. right now, yep. but I'm very open to how it might develop. And also what ends up happening with my screenwriting as well because if my screenwriting, which I haven't talked mm-hmm. about, takes off um, then I may end up not writing more than three for the novel, uh, for the YA dystopian no- um, series. But I'm just, I'm very open at this stage to how things, to how things pan out in the future. Because I've got a good 20, 30 years ahead of me, hopefully, mm. of writing, of writing life alongside all the other things I'm doing. So we shall wait and see. Okay. And also how popular they end up. Because if I... If I get a sense that by the time I get to book three, that these are really taking off and that readers are keen on learning more about these characters, then I think there's definitely room for, there'll definitely be room for writing more because I could always branch off into other characters from the stories rather than focusing on the same protagonist. Okay. So that's where I'm potentially foreseeing this, the way that this might go. Although I, I'm sort of slightly concerned that because this book is only set 20 years in the future, in fact, it's slightly less than 20 now, that by the time I get round to the final books that... <laughs> it might be real time. <laughs> they'll only be a few years away. <laughs> <Right>. Okay. 
So I may have to set them in kind of some sort of alternative universe or or something like that to just keep on pushing the boundaries in terms of where the stories could go. How does your... But hopefully, hopefully book number two will be out 2025. That's what I'm aiming for anyway. That's good. That's good that we have some anticipation then as far as what could be coming down the road. Um, How does your screenwriting have an impact on your authorship? Do they compete for your time or do they complement each other? How do those two different things work together? Yeah, they do compete for my time a little bit, but they also complement in the sense that I can only really be working on one project at a time properly. Um, But at the same time, I think learning about screenwriting has impacted on my writing um, in a good way. So it's, it's really taught me the whole idea of story structure and um, the four act structure and, you know, pacing and rhythm and kind of keeping things tight. And I did notice that after writing my first couple of screenplays and learning some more, more screenwriting skills that actually my novel writing improved after that. Um, so I do look back at my first novel and think, I could do with editing it a little bit, to be honest. Obviously, it got published, but in my head, I feel like it needs editing to to get it up to the sort of standard that I'm at now in terms of my writing skills. So both and, because really, I have two big projects in mind that I'm wanting to work on right now. Um, So one of them is the sequel for Tea for Tolerance. Um, and then the other one is a screenplay adaptation of the life of Gladys Aylward, who was a missionary to China about 100 years ago. Uh, well, 90, 80, 90 years ago. Um, and it's a really, really powerful story. And I've got the rights to the to the memoir of one particular memoirist anyway. Um, and I've started writing a third of it already. So that's something that I really want to be in in some in in some ways that's the one that I want to be investing more of my time in. Um but at the same time I'm very aware that in order to sell books you need to write more books. Mm-hmm. So so I also am very aware of the pressing need to get on with book number 2. Mm-hmm. So there is a little bit of competition going on in there for my time because I also run a social enterprise. So that takes up a good chunk of my time as well. <laughs> you have not a lot of spare time, which is good. It's going to keep you active and no. busy. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, Catherine, as far as connecting with you and following your journey, mm-hmm. I have one more question to kind of end off our conversation. Mm-hmm. But as far as where we can send yep. people, where they can be in your world, where you're active online, where do we send people to be in touch with you? Yep. So the first place I could say is my website. And that's www.catherineblessan.com. Um, and that's Catherine spelt with a K and then an E-R-I-N-E. Um, and I'm sure Dave will get the, the link out with the full spelling as well on the on the show notes. Um, and then you can find me on Twitter. I'm on Twitter as at Kath Blessan. I'm also on TikTok. I've had a bit of a pause from TikTok, though, over the past few months. Um, but I am on there in theory. And I'm also at Kath Blessan there as well. And I'm also on Facebook. And you can find me at Kath- Catherine Blessan on Facebook. So I'm there as an author. And so I have an author page. But I also have my own, my personal page as well. So if you're wanting to follow me as an author, you can find an author page or Catherine Blessan, author. Okay. So, Catherine, we have a group of young authors assembled here listening to the podcast. They're mm-hmm. looking for an action item, something they can do in their writing today as they sit down to write. And you, as an author, a screenplay writer, any kind of words of wisdom that we can do today in our writings that would give us some context or help us to stay motivated? Anything that comes to mind that would be helpful for a young author that you could think of? Mm. the the key one when it comes to young authors I think is reading widely in your genre and in one sense that's nothing to do with writing but in another sense it's everything to do with writing because it 
it gives you a sense of the nuances of language um and it gives you a sense of what 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 works in the genres that you're interested in so read widely but also read as much as possible in the types of genres and stories that you might be interested in writing yourself because you want to learn that sense of pacing um and that sense of what works as far as character tropes and um themes are concerned as far as as far as th- those particular genres are concerned so that would be my greatest encouragement because i know a lot of people don't read widely these days and it is extremely important to read widely if you are going to write. So that would be my greatest tip. Excellent. I like that. As a young person. One of my favorite quotes or thoughts around that is, you do not know what you do not know. So by reading and expanding your world, you're going to learn more and it's going to help you with your writing. So that really fits. Yeah. Yeah. And every reader is a writer. Mm. Or the other way around, every writer is a reader, Mm -hmm. that type of pithy quote as well. Excellent. Catherine, thank you so much for being on the show. <laughs> it's so great to have you here and to learn about your journey as an author and to know that there's more great things coming down the road. So as those things develop in the future, please consider coming back. Give us an update on your journey as an author and celebrate new releases in the future. I'd love to have you come back. Oh, thank you very much, Dave. I've loved being on here. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Excellent. Everyone, all the information for Catherine is always included in the show notes. Please go click through and give her a follow over there on Twitter and TikTok and Facebook and check out her website as well. And when you leave, when you buy a book from Catherine, be sure you leave an excellent detailed review so that other people can learn more about Catherine as well and all the great books that she's putting out into the world. Catherine, again, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Hey, thanks for being here for the Living in the Next Chapter podcast. So glad to have you as part of our family of listeners. There's a seat for you just here on Living in the Next Chapter, and I'm so happy that you have listened to all the way to the end. Wow, you are now my new bestie. I want to let you know that I host seven other podcasts on top of Living in the Next Chapter. Yep, eight total. One of them is called the How To Podcast Series. If you are thinking, you know what, Dave, this podcast thing seems like a lot of fun. Well, I'll give you a secret. It is. It's a great, amazing, fun time where you can get to meet great people, get your word out there, promote your book, promote what your coaching program, whatever you're doing. Podcasting is great. And if you want to learn how to do this, what you're hearing right now, head over to howtopodcast.ca and look up the How to Podcast series on YouTube whatever app you're listening on, you'll find me there. And I'd love for you to come listen to how to do this. And if you're interested and have questions on how to podcast, reach out to me at howtopodcast.ca. Thank you for listening. Talk soon.